Yellowstone supervolcano. Why the USGS geologists warned a three-day July eruption could bury the whole of the United States in four feet of ash. You can, can see, see that, that over, over that three-day period, period, this, this umbrella, umbrella cloud covers, covers most of the North, North American, American continent. continent. And, um, and, then and then it gradually disperses with, uh, with wind patterns. And so, and so if you look at what the Tefra deposit, deposit might look, look, at, look like, like from that, so, so these are four different three-day three simulations, um, one, one in January, January one in April, one in July, one in October. Um, you, might you might be trying, trying to squint to see what these numbers, numbers represent. The pale, pale yellow is one to three millimeters. 3 to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 100, 100 to 300, and for these dark regions, we have, we're talking about over a meter of ash. For one month duration, again, it's fairly similar. There is some compression on the upwind side of these, some of these events. But um, again, as we go to a month, one month duration, we're decreasing the average eruption rate. Callum Hoare reports on Express UK how the Yellowstone supervolcano scientists revealed how a three-day long eruption in July could bury the surrounding area of the caldera in up to four feet of volcanic ash. The caldera is labeled a supervolcano because it has the ability to inflict devastation on a global level, worldwide that is. It's Pinned between the states of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho, the volcano is constantly monitored by the USGS for signs that a super eruption is on its way. An eruption of this kind has not occurred, we're talking about a super eruption, has not occurred for more than 630,000 years, but scientists are still concerned over the effects it could have on Earth. Larry Mastin, a USGS hydrologist worked with fellow colleague Jacob Lowenstern in 2016 to produce a paper on the ashfall impacts in the event of another super eruption. Well, we've had more eruptions from Yellowstone since then. We've had one which was a large eruption 70,000 years ago, and we've had 80 other eruptions since then. One just about every 6,000 years. And uh, Lowenstern claims that we are overdue by about 10,000 years. Now, speaking during public lecture of that year, 2016, he explained the objective was to see how the growth of umbrella clouds would affect ash distribution from Yellowstone. He said, we did a few dozen simulations, starting with an eruption volume of a few hundred cubic kilometers of magma. So this is, if you consider the volume of tephra that expands as it erupts, the volume of the tephra blanket that forms would be a few times greater than that of the magma alone. So this would be comparable to a tephra volume over 1,000 cubic kilometers. We use a duration that ranged from three days to one month and an umbrella cloud height that ranged from about 15 to 35 kilometers, that's 9 to 18 miles up into the atmosphere. The wind fields were randomly chosen from hysteric, historical patterns, but turns out they are actually not that important. Mr. Masson then demonstrates, he demonstrated how the Yellowstone supervolcano would bury the majority of North America in volcanic ash, with some regions more heavily affected than others. He detailed how the duration of the eruption, or the time of the year, seemed to make little change on its consequences. He added, so in these situations, in these simulations, you can see that over a three-day period, this umbrella cloud covers most of the North American continent. Then it gradually disperses with wind patterns, so you can look at the tephra deposit in these four different three-day simulations one in January, one in April, one in July, and one in October. The pale yellow is one to three millimeters, and then it goes up to a three, point, three to 10 millimeters, then from 10 to 30, and then from 30 to 100 millimeters, and then from 100 to 300, and the dark regions are over 
three feet of ash. If you go to a one week duration, the pattern looks pretty similar and for one month it is fairly the same. But as you go to one month, we're decreasing the average eruption rate, which is weakened, weakening the growth of the umbrella cl uh, cloud. He's talking about the uh, ash cloud. Mr. Mastin detailed during the same lecture how he made a puzzling find during his research into the ash fall of the Yellowstone, a Yellowstone eruption. He said, there have been three major events identified at Yellowstone in the last two million years. The largest was the Huckleberry Ridge 2.1 million years ago. It had a volume of about 2,500 cubic meters of magma. Then there was the Mesa Falls eruption of 1.3 million years ago and Lava Creek, the second of the two Lava Creek eruptions about 600,000 years ago. So these are volumes estimated just from these deposits and not included in the Tefra Fall deposits that may have been transported over 620 miles in distance. That's about 1,000 kilometers in distance. The duration of these eruptions is not really constrained, but the experts are inclined to think that they were on maybe days, very rapid days, maybe weeks to the longest. Mr. Masson went on to reveal how findings from the Huckleberry Ridge eruption prove Yellowstone has the power to send ash deposits across the U.S. as far as California. That's roughly 1,000 miles away. He also explained how wind patterns seem to have little impact, making prediction, predicting future events even harder. And he continued by adding, these eruptions did produce Tefra Falls. In other words, deposits were produced by Tefra and rose, buoying, rose, uh, rose buoyantly, drifting downwind during these eruptions. We know that from the scattered deposits around the United States, but in fact, he says in a more recent map of these deposits, we have been able to find them as far west as California, Oregon, and even offshore to the west. So this adds a real puzzle to this because of the significant upwind from Yellowstone. Even if you look at wind patterns that may have existed in the last few million years, it seems unlikely that the wind pattern would have changed dramatically to send ash deposits that far to the west. Now, in uh, my conclusion here, I'd like to comment that in one of the past articles that I had read concerning the 630,000 uh, eruption, uh, the super eruption that happened 630,000 years ago, they found that that happened in two sections 170 years apart, but they clump it up as one eruption. And that's why they have the tephra uh, found in going in one direction, and then the other half of the mountain over the tephra is going in another direction. So you have a mountain with two sections of tephra. One is uh, leaning in one direction, and the, other, the upper part is leaning in another direction, showing that the wind patterns were changed during those two uh, sections of the eruption, which was a huge, so we were talking about 300 feet, so you have a tephra, the, the lower part of 130 feet going in one direction, and the other 130 feet on top of that going into another direction. And it's a very, uh, very strange thing to see. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on 
your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.